I'm going to pause the recording though. Okie dokie. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. It is um, National um, Bird Feeding Month, which um, we celebrate in February. So uh, what better way to do that if you're not already feeding birds is to learn a little bit about um, what we should be feeding them and that sort of thing. So um, we thought we would do this webinar here, and I have to say a big thank you. This webinar is being made possible by the Pauline J. and John R. Cook Lecture Fund, um, and Clem is really um, lucky to have their support so we can get awesome speakers in um, to do these um, webinars and hopefully in person here again <laughs> soon. Um, and um, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Sam Burbach and I am the Director of Education and Programming out at CLEM. Uh, we've got a lot of fun programs coming up here um, and more specifically tied in with uh, National Bird Feeding Month. Um, we do have an activity on Monday um, February 21st uh, for kids. And this is kind of a drop-in workshop. Um, so if you've got kids or grandkids that you're watching, it's um, a day out of school for a lot of kids. And so we're doing a winter bird feeder activity with WonderWorks project partners. They'll be joining me out at CLEM and we'll be doing some hands-on activities um, from 10 until noon on February 21st. So check out our website if you want more information about that. Um, we also have a winter bird watching walk uh, with Joel Nyland from Wild Birds Unlimited, and that is going to be on um, Saturday, February 26th. Um, so we've got information about that on our website to um, do some bird watching out at Clem. And then also on Saturday, um, February 26th um, is going to be Winter Trails and Naturalist Tales with University of Illinois Extension. Um, out in Pecatonica, and Peggy will be uh, presenting there as well as a couple other um, speakers, and that's always a, a fun event of um, learning, and also you could go outside and do some, some hiking and bird watching there as well. So lots to do um, in the state line area coming up here this month. Um, so uh, if you would like more information about the CLEM programs, check out our website. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Winter Trails and Naturalist Tales, you can check out the University of Illinois Extension website um, and uh, learn more about how you can participate in any of those programs. Um, so for tonight, um, we've got Peggy Doty here and she is the Natural Resources and Environmental, um, Natural Resources and Environment and Natural it's Resources, all, yeah. Energy and Environment, I, I, am I getting it backwards? Um, educator for <laughs> Boone, funny. DeKalb and Ogle counties. Um, and so she is joining us um, to talk to us about uh, feeding birds through the winter. Nice, awesome, will, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Oh, um, sorry, I always forget to say this. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, your microphones are turned off during this presentation, so go ahead and type those into the Q&A box, um, and we'll check those at the end of the presentation, um, but send them through as you get them because uh, you don't want to forget your question by the end of the presentation. Um, and then there's also a, a chat box that Peggy's going to be asking some questions, and you can um, type into the chat box when she does that. And there's options like you can send it just to host and panelists or you can send it to everyone. Um, and so if you switch it over to everyone, then we can all kind of interact together. Um, otherwise, if it's on host and panelists, which is the default, um, at least uh, Peggy and I will see that and can uh, see what you submit there. But uh, without further ado, I will zip it and let you take over. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Sam and I worked together years ago and um, I miss her. So this is really fun to be doing something together again. I love it. And I will let you know, clearly I'm not in a normal office. I am home. Um, so uh, there are noises. There are pets. Um, uh, my son is meandering around. Uh, he is uh, talking in Spanish. So <laughs> if you hear some, some strange uh, voice with a non-clear, unless you speak Spanish, um, that's him. And uh, yeah, I'm so excited. I haven't done this program for a little while. And 
being the being February and bird feeding month, I'm like, hmm, it's a perfect timing. I'm glad that I'm glad Sam asked and reached out. Um, and yes, um, if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A. And that way we like to save the questions until the end, because some people want to get back to what they were doing um, and then, you know, get get through the program. And if they want to leave and others want to stay on, I have nothing else to do tonight. So I can answer those questions until they're all answered. My name is here, Peggy Doty, and we are actually now, we just changed names, so poor Sam didn't have a, have a chance. We are now under Natural Resources, Environment, and Energy uh, with the University of Illinois Extension. And at the bottom of that is my email. So if you're taking notes, jot that down. It's the last place you'll see it um, in the presentation. P.S. for Peggy Sue. Yes, it's a long story. My sister was a Buddy Holly fan and for some reason got the right to name me. I don't know what that was about but it's psdoty at illinois.edu. I don't have a survey or an evaluation, but by all means, any feedback, um, constructive of any kind, um, interest, excitement, I love to get emails uh, from people and uh, I would be more than happy to honor those as they come in. So we're gonna get started a little bit more um, introduction about me. Uh, I actually, my first degree in college is in wildlife management. So I have a very, deep interest and spend a lot of time um, focusing on people and animals and the interface where we meet them. And of course, birds, bird feeding, unless you're afraid of birds, tends to be one of the more positive and exciting areas. Uh, and I will say that uh, as I was in college, I came home for the holiday and my mom and dad and I were going to, it was a church service, regular Sunday service. And in my degree, I was studying fur-bearing mammals like deer, raccoons, coyotes, et cetera, with a almost minor and waterfowl. I love it when I can see the bird and tell what it is. And as we were walking in church, there were these pigeons roosted above the door and I yelled duck because we had to go in. There was all these pigeons. And my dad swung around to my mother and said, dear gosh, Joanne, what are we spending on her college education? She just called those pigeons ducks. <laughs> He was a jokester, but I'll never forget it because it was quite funny. So moving on, now you know a little bit about me. I'm afraid to touch this twice because it's a delay. I'm hoping for that. Let's see if this one will do it. Oh, now if it goes a second time, guys, I'll back it up because we had a little delay. And once we got going, it was fine in the practice round. So moving on to bird feeding. Why do we invest <clears throat> in feeding the neighborhood? And here's a list I came up with. You know, I think there's always been an amazement with flight. No matter what century you look at, humans have uh, an interest in flight. We created airplanes and helicopters and, and different flight maneuvering beasts. Um, we like to bring wild creatures close. And there's something not as fearful, again, if you're not afraid of birds, to bring small creatures to the feeders. They come um, quite readily. It's harder to coax other animals in and you shouldn't but the birds, um, definitely you can bring them to you quite quickly. <clears throat> and that's, that's an easy way to get that connection, especially in the winter during the long dark season, especially if you are um, stuck inside for any reason, weather, injury. Um, I had a long uh, healing process one time and that was what I could do, right? It was to sit and watch the birds eat. The joy of watching that observation. I remember my grandmother, she owned every cardinal in the neighborhood. They, my cardinal this, my cardinal's that. Educational for observers. We have a lot of um, homeschool kids that use birding and bird watching as part of their educational um, foundation to lots of areas from science to, so, to social studies. <clears throat> um, helpful. I put a question mark by helpful and we may get into that a little bit. We're feeding the birds because we want to see the birds. The birds have been here for a long time. The birds don't need us. We want them to need us. And I would say, especially in COVID, it, it felt good to do something we could do to help something else. But I don't know that it's helpful. I think it's just what it is. Um, you want to, and I put in here that maybe you just want to spend money all winter to gripe about squirrels at the coffee shop, right? I hear a lot about squirrels out there. Um, being at the feeders. And of course, they're great entertainment. I just started feeding the birds in February because the cost of seed was so high this year. They have finally found it and it keeps my two indoor cats completely enamored at the window. So there's a lot of reasons we do it. So feeding stations. So the big thing is what's the best place in your yard for feeders? It's easy to set up a feeding station in nice weather. 
right? So you go, oh, I'm going to put it over here in the corner of the yard, and then it snows, and then you get ice, and then it becomes a dangerous trek to get out there. So think about what the weather's like where you are. Think about how close it is to your back door or front door, wherever you go out, and consider the path to get there isn't in any way dangerous once some snow is over the top of things. Um, short fencing can be a real trip hazard. Uh, just make sure you have a clear path. Think about snow and ice. Um, and how can you make it really convenient to maintain? Uh, how much time are you willing to spend in maintenance? So if you put out a whole bunch of feeders, do as I say, not as I do, you have to maintain and clean them, especially if you start to see any disease. A lot of times um, we have eye, you know, eye inflammation and eye diseases that are passed readily from bird to bird that are rubbing faces on the feeders uh, and on each other. And you know, the Northern Illinois climate, not always easy. Uh, the ice is always my fear. Um, I've fallen enough times on ice. I don't need to do it anymore. Um, and there's no limit to the creativity. You don't have to buy a feeder. You can create feeding a feeding station with all kinds of things. The, we pick feeders for ourselves, for our eyes, a lot of times, but we don't, we don't realize they'd eat off of a, uh, as, as my boyfriend would say, they'd eat that off of a flip-flop. They don't care what it's on. They just want to eat, right? So we get a little carried away. And then finally, what's your budget? You know, what do you, what do you really want to spend? When should you start feeding the birds? Um, this year, it was a little bit, it's expensive, all right? So in the chat, if you will, just for fun as we go forward, drop your favorite feeder bird, okay? Not a duck, not a hawk. I know the hawks come in and do buffet line, but the birds that actually eat at the feeders, if you would drop in the chat, um, if you're willing, um, just your favorite feeder bird. And then I'm going to move on a step and, and see and watch and see with what you guys have. And then I'll tell you mine. Whoops, we might go twice. Let me make sure we're in the same place. So our goal, right? This is our goal. We want to provide habitat. What are their needs? If they are short on something in the winter, it's going to be food, water, and shelter. Space is not relative right now because they're not guarding their territory. They're not protecting space. So we don't have to worry about that at this time, but food, water, shelter. And I'm going to tell you coming up here that the priority is going to be water. All right. So water is the number one need of all these birds in the winter above and beyond the food, because the food is usually something they're used to eating, even though it's not pretty and kept in a really pretty feeder. Now, something to consider a bird niche. And I love all these birds coming in because there's these different niches are being answered um, by the choices that you have in the chat there. And we'll look at those in a second, all right? So a niche, think of N is for niche as N is for neighborhood. It's where an animal spends its time, right? So if you're a bird watcher, you're probably smarter than I am about this, but a bird lives in shrubs, in trees, on them, under them. They prefer to be on the ground. If you feed birds, you're gonna see birds that like to get the seeds that hit the ground and are more often on the ground than up in a feeder. We have, um, these are just like a neighborhood in your community, right? People tend to, to be in, in, their, in the neighborhood of their choice. Birds tend to be in their neighborhood of choice within that small space of community, which is your backyard, okay? So consider your birds and their niche in the in uh, offer them something that's comfortable and attracts them to where they would prefer to eat because they don't want to all eat in the same space. And that's a good way when you're considering what to feed, to feed, you could feed the same food, which is what I do in a variety of ways and get the most uh, different species for winter bird feeding. I'm looking at the chat and there's a lot of woodpecker lovers out there. Um, I love woodpeckers, mostly because I know all seven because I can learn them. And then <laughs> you can say, you know, all the wood, all the woodpeckers, right? Cardinal. Yeah, the cardinal, the scientific name for the cardinal is Cardinalis Cardinalis, which means red, red, which finally makes sense. Um, nuthatch. I love the nuthatch. My little kids, um, Lynn, they always yell bluebird because it's that gunmetal blue, but they don't think about where the bird is up and down on the tree. Um, and I always think about how hard it is to teach birds to kids when I see a nut hatch because they think of eggs, but now this bird particularly comes out of a nut. I'm not sure where the ornithologist got their thoughts on all this. Thanks for sharing that, you guys. It's fun to see. All right, so we're gonna focus on feet. 
all right? How a bird's feet are adapted allows them to eat in a manner that matches their beak. We don't think about that when we're picking food and picking feeders, but how, how their feet work makes the decision for how their, how their beak's gonna be um, useful to them. It's a toolbox. If you've ever heard me speak before, I always talk about animals toolbox. Every animal has a toolbox. All the tools have to be in good order and kept. When you lose one tool out of your toolbox, your percentage chance of survival drops immensely, no matter if you're a mammal, a bird, a fish, whatever it is. And the feet and beak are very important tools. Uh, so we're gonna look at that. So the feet are so neat. I love, I love this. So perching feet, creeping feet, and hopping feet. Those are the feet you're gonna see at the feeders, all right? I was told when I first did this program, um, long time ago, I didn't have enough pictures. So there, I, I added pictures. So we'll look at all these different feet. So here's some finches. Um, look at how they're perching, they're gripping, all right? They have three toes in the front and one toe in the back. So they're kind of like this in the front with that one hooked in the back. They could fly up and grab a tree, but they can't climb the tree. They can grip, but they more normally want to sit on a branch. In this case, they really like this dollar store cheap little kaleidoscopy feeder thing. They used that a lot. It's a tiny edge, but it's got a little bit of a lip on it and they could grab it. Um, the anisodactyl, the anisodactyl means three and then one in the back, um, allows that thumb to, if you will, to hang on. There's a goldfinch fading quickly, right? Actually looking at that sunshine, I'm thinking he might be coming into, I can't remember when I took that picture, it might be spring, he might be molting into his, into his gold. But see the three toes in the front? And hidden is that back one on the lip of that feeder. And so there's another perchy bird. Now we're going into the creepy birds, not creepy, creeping, right? So the people that love their woodpeckers, here's the downy, the smallest of the woodpeckers, and they have zygodactyl toes. So they'll throw those two in the front and then they'll have two in the back. I can't do it on this very well, but that's how they ladder up the tree. And then they use their tail as a wedge because those last bones in the tail, um, those are all, all fused together. So they have this paddle of vertebrae that are just like one piece and they use that as one of their tools um, and that way they can creep. And if you think about it, uh, Lynn had the nuthatch, right? I think it was Lynn. All the birds that can creep are seven woodpeckers of which not all are present. The, the yellow-bellied sapsucker is gone right now. So now you're down to five. And if you don't have the big pileated woodpecker, now you're down to four, okay? Those four nuthatches and little brown creepers, there's only seven species that are utilizing trees and digging out old bugs, that are sleeping, they're spider eggs, spiders, they go up into those bark, into the bark and pick those out. They can do that and be at the feeder, but they don't have that much competition. And I think that's it's brilliant, it's brilliant. So sadly I had a hairy, I saw somebody had a hairy woodpecker as their favorite. So this is an up close of a hairy foot. Look at those, look at those chunky toes. My guess is those are pretty muscular, right? That those are strips of muscle that allow that gripping and that tightening um, to grip. But look at the right. We haven't talked about, we aren't going to get into tongues. If you want to see, there's an Illinois, um, I did an Illinois woodpecker video on extensions, everyday environments webinars. If you type in everyday environment webinars, extension, whatever, there's a ton of videos. And I did one on woodpeckers, but look at this tongue, you guys, the tip of it is actually, let's see if I can get my mouse up here. The tip of it from that line right there on the right, that's tendon. This is the pinky tongue. This is tendon. The woodpeckers have, and you can barely see it, but there's all these barbs like fish hooks, like a harpoon. So they can stick that in the, under the bark in a hole and puncture and pull out anything. So think about a fish hook and a marshmallow, right? So those guys, I just have to throw this in here because it's amazing. And it's another reason why, and I think I bring it up later, you don't wanna have, um, you don't wanna have just metal suet feeders or anything metal that they're gonna be tapping peanut butter, anything because their tongue will stick to metal and rip, rip it off. So be very conscious that Feeders that are for suet eaters should be coated metal, okay? Very important. So there's a red-bellied. Uh, I would have called it the red mohawk bird, right? A woodpecker. And he's gripping that feeder straight up and down and is completely comfortable. 
Here's a nut hatch. This happens to be the white breasted. We do have red breast breasted nut hatches at my nature center. I, I work in Genoa in a satellite office for extension. Uh, I run the natural resource education center and this is our bird feeding station. It's either mine or the work one that you'll see in the photos. So there's your white breasted up and down, totally in control. Um, wonderful, just cute as a button too. First at the feeders in the morning. Now we're going into the hopping birds. It's impossible for me to show you this, the pictures uh, the way I wanted to, but hopping birds, the ones that are on the ground to me look like they have bigger feet, which would make sense. Cause if you've ever watched um, and you can add it in the chat, I'll just check, I'll open the chat and check. I don't know, have any of you seen how they'll, they'll hop? They're trying to kick up stuff, you know and they're kicking up looking for the fresh seed that isn't just a shell of a seed. They're, you know, who knows maybe they think there's gonna be a bug in there um, but they love to kick. And those hopping birds are hopping and they prefer the ground. Will they eat up in a feeder? Well, yeah, I, you know, just cause you know, something's high up in the refrigerator or way back in the back. If I want it, I'm gonna dig it out, right? So the hopping birds um, prefer the ground. So if you can feed on a lower feeder for them, um, it makes a lot of difference. It really does help. We have a delay. I'm sitting here waiting for it. I know it's going to click about the time I want it to go. There it is. There's my favorite. I didn't put my favorite in the chat. The tufted titmouse is my absolute favorite. That darling little bird. I put the picture in on the right. These are my photos, you guys. They're not the best. They have this little Peter Pan hat thing going. They've got that dark black eye with that white eye ring, and they are hoppers. You, they will land in the feeder more, more than the juncos will. But they love to hop around in the debris. Um, very tiny, petite little guys. And they definitely have three toes in the front, one in the back. They're perching birds. And then the rule breakers, you know, the chickadees, go <laughs> darn them. They're supposed to perch. But these guys, when they really want something, right, they love bugs. If a tree falls in the forest, the chickadees are the first ones there. They hear that crashing sound and they're thinking bugs and they come from everywhere just to see what, what popped out, right? So of course, they'll break the rules. So when you're setting up your feeders, you'll be like, well, Peggy, I didn't put anything on the ground and I've got juncos. Well, of course, because they're hungry, but you can, you know, if you can address their niche, it's a lot more fun. And then of course, there's the soaring feet and soaring feet eat feet. This happens to be a Cooper's Hawk at my neighbor's. They had uh, chickens but they weren't after the chickens. And I had to call the neighbor and said, oh, he's too, the chickens are too big for a Cooper's hawk, but they had a rodent problem because of the chicken food. So yeah, he was out looking and uh, checking out, which was great for me. Cause at that time I was feeding the birds and I was like, Ooh, I don't need him to join them. But if you, if you set a table outdoors and leave food out, it's, it's really unkind to choose who eats there. Um, and it also burns a lot of energy. So if you just open up the door, open up those feeders and say, let's see what happens. It's a lot more fun than stressing. Um, at the nature center, uh, the deer come in at the end of the day and pretty much finish off something if, if they find it. Um, and I always say what takes a chickadee all day long takes a deer one lick, but it's fine, right? So beaks are neat. We talked about the feet. So the shape of the bird's beak has to also help decide its diet and what you're feeding, right? We have beak types, chisel beaks. Of course, the woodpeckers, they're pressing and poking and pressing and poking. Vice grips, your seed eaters, like that stay at the feeder. So cardinals sit at your feeder. The finches sit at your feeder. They can, they can crack seeds all day and never fly away. But everybody else that doesn't have a vice grip has to leave to open that seed, right? If it's not a swallowable seed, they know doves will swallow up things, right? But these guys, uh, the vice grips, they'll just sit and crack them. The probing beak, that's the little brown creeper. The nut hatches, they're picking up under the bark for bugs. Even in the winter, they're looking for those, for those bug eggs and bugs that are sleeping. And then the net-like beak, which are there in our migrators, right? Those are like your fly catchers and your Phoebes. Um, the funny thing is, and, and maybe you've seen this, I love swallow babies, which are in the fly catching family, right? Because the babies have these big lips when they're little. Well, of course, because then when they age, those lips are actually part of an extended, almost like a cheek. And so when they fly, they just open their mouth and they actually can net things. You're not going to see them trying to net a seed at your feeder. Not going to happen. So I love this picture of this red belly because it makes his beak look really long. And I, I almost wondered if he thought that was what was happening. But notice he's got that grip 
he's gripped it above his left shoulder there. He's got his toe like he's tapping it like a velociraptor and he's picking a seed. What amazes me is they will have all this black oil sun. That's all I feed is black oil sunflower seed. We're going to talk about the different seed types. Um, this is the most bang for the buck. And he will sit and pick and knock tons of seed out and pick one. And I want to know what that is. The nut hatches do it. They sit and pick through it. What are they looking for? I don't know. I don't know that I'll ever know. Here's your hairy woodpecker to my hairy woodpecker friend. Um, whenever people see a downy at the feeder and go, oh my gosh, that's the biggest downy I've seen in my life. It's usually a hairy. They look very similar, but the beak is much longer on the, on the hairy. The hairy has less of a dust, dust mask, less feathering around the face. Um, and there's some, some slight color variation, but notice the toes, right? We have the two in the front, two in the back. And that's allowing him to pick whatever he's after or she right at whatever she's after right there. And then the downy. I love it. Look at that. That's special. When you're tiny, lightweight, and you have zygodactyl feet, you can feed anywhere. And if they love this, think about how creative you could be with food. You could, you could put holes in a log that you suspend in nice weather. So when you're ready, you just reach up and put some, you know, a peanut butter cornmeal mix in there, not straight peanut butter. It's a little sticky. The cornmeal, if you add cornmeal to your, um, some people add lard, um, but you, we add, we add sometimes a little bit of lard and cornmeal. You add that extra fat going in there. Um, if you do a program, if you're a volunteer by chance and you do a program, we have to remember that we can't use peanut butter anymore. Too many allergies. So if we're doing it for a group, we use lard and cornmeal to get a, a big fat content going. There's that vice grip, picking those seeds apart right there. No problem. Shred them, picks them out. You got to give them a pat on the back. They do all this without their hands, right? They have no hands. So um, when you, I do this activity with kids with a pair of pliers, they have to open up a sunflower seed and get the meat out of the sunflower seed without using their hands. They get very frustrated, but they have a whole new respect for birds that have to do it every day. Uh, Cardinal, notice the the, how bad that feeder looks. That feeder is long gone. The, it's been destroyed, but they don't care um, what it looks like. So don't, if you don't have or don't want to spend a ton of money on the, on the feeders, create something out of something you have because <laughs> they don't care. There's the little brown creepers. Keep an eye out for these guys. It's getting a little warmer, but they'll be going up and down trees looking for the, the bugs that'll start moving around and they blend in so well. They're very small. Um, very quiet, sneaky, but that little proby beak helps them get in there and those cracks. So your feeders, you know, you could put it on the ground, uh, preferably on something because of water, but on a rock or a tray. Rocks are nice. Rocks, unless they have a hole in them, they tend to naturally absorb water away or run it off. Um, so if you can pile up seed on a rock, that's, that's perfect. Um, everything here is what we've talked about, high and low platforms hanging. Um, and at the bottom where I talk about suet feeders there, notice that no uncoated metal for suet feeders, please. Um, it's just, it's very dangerous for our, for our birds, especially those woodpeckers. Um, and make sure they work. I'll, I have a feeder coming up somewhere in here. Um, and one of the things I didn't talk about, it came up recently. Um, it comes up almost every year in the spring. I get phone calls that people ask me, where did all the cardinals go? The male cardinals because they'll say I had 10, I had 12. We have to remember there's no there's no fighting going on. There's no territory, no courtship going on. Um, so everybody's happy to eat together. Already though, last week I got a call that my the there weren't as many cardinals at the feeder, and one of them was going to all these high places around the yard and just sitting there. Well, they're they're starting to lay out their territory. So a, a, a northern cardinal has about a two to three. Okay, yard size is average, but two to three yards of, you know, backyards, front yards, they get a territory and they go scouting for all the high points right now. They're not ready yet, but they want to know where they're going to fight for territory. And then they go sing. It's not the ugliest war, right? They just sing at the top of their lungs and all those high spots. And then every cardinal male has to spread out and then start courting females. Um, and that's how that, that's why they're starting to do that. I had a little girl one time. It, uh, I do field studies for kids. And she said, Miss Peggy, I just know you're going to know this bird in my yard. I've never seen him, but every day he says root beer to me. And I'm like, why, how would I know this? I'm like, I don't know how, how to know what that is without seeing the bird. She goes, 
no, but what bird says root beer? I said, I don't know a single bird. I love root beer, but I don't know who says root beer. I said, wait a minute, tell me how it says root beer. And she goes, root, 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 root beer. I'm like, that's a cardinal. <laughs> so now every time I hear cardinals, all I hear is root beer um, because of that little girl. But I thought how clever that, you know, she came up with something that she could relate that sound to and tell me, you know, later, I was pretty impressed with her abilities. So where to put your feeders? I put mine right out my back door because I know snow's coming and I don't love being cold. Um, you want them in the open. A lot of people will hang them in shrubs and trees and it's really scary for the birds. They may still eat out of them, but the stress level um, is gonna increase how much they burn the calories and fat. So you want it where they can go to cover, but you don't want it in the cover. You want a reasonable distance. And if you wanna watch them through your window, um, one way to decrease um, death by window slams is to put them really close to the window because they come in and they slow down coming into the window. But if something spooks them, they take off and they're not, they're so close to the window, they haven't even gotten speed up. I've not lost a bird. I've had them hit the window. Of course, the Cooper's Hawks, you know, get everybody all jazzed up, but they fly away because my, I put my shepherd's hook that hold my feeders I put them out in the fall and I stand there and I hold them by my bay window and I tip them and I make sure that if they fall, they miss the window, but they're just out of range and that's where I put them. And that way I have the feeders close enough. I can sit without binoculars. Everybody comes in, the cats get to watch bird TV and they get used to people moving around and it's just so wonderful to see them, but just make sure nothing's gonna wind whip and hit and break a window if you do that or all the way away from your window. So when they take off, hopefully they don't see that. Depends on the time of year, how the reflections change, you know, fall and spring, there's a time when the windows reflect the outdoors. And then that's when we have a lot of window, window hits. So here's my, fir my bird feeding station. Some of this has aged out but I remember when I said, make sure they work. So this, this top feeder with the goldfinch, I don't know if you can tell, and it's over here as well. It's green on the tube, but it's blue here. So I got this, I paid decent money for this one. And then I had one from the dollar store and it was working just fine, but this one, nobody could eat, but the chickadees. And I watched it and I watched it. Everybody would land on it, but nobody would eat. And then I realized the perches weren't long enough. They had shortened them to save money on this, you know, pricier bird feeder. And so I had a Culver's straw. I'm a, I'm a freak about recycling and trying to use things till they can't be used. So I had, I brought home at some point a Culver's blue straw that was washed out in the drawer. I went out and it was a perfect fit. So I stuck it on and I could see through, um, through the straw where the end was. And I added like a half an inch and cut them off the birds all started cleaning out that feeder. They, they couldn't bend and stay on the perch. They were too big except for the chickadee. And then this one, this, this box one, just something from probably farm and fleet, the seeds weren't flowing. They'd pick it clean, but there'd be all these seeds. And I realized that the plastic was down so far that the opening wasn't, wasn't big enough to make it easy to flow. So I cut a wine cork um, in half I'm not going to talk about the wine cork. I cut a wine cork in half and I hot glued it. So when it was like a, a bumper and the seeds, the, the plastic could no longer come all the way down. And that, that fixed that problem. So kind of watch your feeders because clearly I've had two that, that didn't work. Uh, the rest of these, yeah, these are fine. This was my favorite, the far right one. That was a tree in the forest. <laughs> and I don't know what kind of tree it is. Somebody in the group might know, but it looks little but it took a guy to help me lift it. I mean, it was like two of us to lift this little thing. And then um, it was actually my boyfriend. I said, could you make a feeder out of that for me? And so he took some scrap lumber. Always remember to put drill holes for drainage. Not so big that the seeds get stuck in them, although the woodpeckers do love to pick at them, um, but you want drainage. So we had holes around the edges there for drainage. Oh my gosh, they loved it. The one thing I should have done is I should have drilled some holes in the, in the trunk there and maybe each year put some you know, lard and cornmeal or something suety in those. And then, cause the woodpeckers loved going up and down that just for the sake, that's where their niche is, right? 
And then these are the feeders at the nature center. Like I said, the one at the top right is missing the plastic. So the birds eat on one side, the squirrels eat on the other. The, uh, the, these things just get so high weathered. Um, I did have a chipmunk go in that top left one or one like it that was more shut. It pushed up the, the plexiglass, ate its way full and then couldn't get out. So that was exciting to release the chipmunk. And then the blue jay, you can tell he's filling his gullet. His throat is full. He's not picking them. He's just swallowing them. Um, but they don't care what it looks like. This was a tree stump with an old, very old feeder board that just kept falling apart. But they don't care. They don't care. So looking at the food choices, I did this. And it's been a while since I did this. So you may find that you know something I don't know about um, today. But this was the general price and what happened. So I, the striped sunflowers, um, they might cost a little more, but not as many birds can open a striped sunflower. All the feeder birds that you can attract here in Northern Illinois, they can eat oil sunflower seeds. They can open them, but the striped, the uh, chickadees have a hard time, the nuthatches, because they have to grab that seed, go up into a perch and peck it open. Even your woodpeckers, you guys, the woodpeckers don't have muscles here, right? They Their tools are different. They can't peck open even an oil sunflower seed, no matter how big, even your red belly that you like so much. But what they do is they, that's why they leave. They take it, put it in the tree, peck it open. The perchers take it up, put it in their feet, or maybe put it in the tree, peck it open. And that's what they have to do. So think about that when you're, when you're buying food. Again, I've I only feed oil sunflower seed. It's just convenient. Everything gets cleaned up. Um, I like it for mulch. Um, it's, in a, it's in a bed that's mature, so I don't have to worry about as many weeds. The, the mature plants aren't affected by them at all. Um, the hauled sunflowers are great, but they will go fast. Uh, the thistle, of course, is pricey. And now they make it so that it, it doesn't germinate, which is nice. Uh, millet. Uh, it's small, it's fully consumable. A lot of doves, doves and, and birds that swallow whole will like that. Safflower, I hear mixed results about safflower, and I think it's a timing thing. I think it's a getting ready, you know, getting through winter, they want more fat, getting ready to breed and court, they're going to want more protein. So I think you have to offer, if you choose to offer more than, than oil sunflower seeds, just think about the timing. Crack corn is going to attract everybody, right? Everybody, squirrels, big blue jays, crows, uh, starlings, everything. Then you have these others, the flax, the rapeseed, the canary seed, and then seed mixes. You can blend seed your own, you know, buy bulk and blend it. Um, you can do that. But um, here's the, what I came up with, with research that I did. So oil sunflower seeds in the winter, we're after fat for warmth. Birds are shivering at night and birds lose 20%. I can't remember where I read that. Um, it was a research project and it was an average 20% of their body weight every night and chickadees were at the 20%. So a chickadee eats all day and shivers all night to be here tomorrow. So at 43% at fat, those oil sunflower seeds are critical. At 43% fat, it equaled 250 seeds a day on the super cold nights where they have to really you know, shiver to stay warm. So the protein's lower than the thistle, but the fat is higher. And then if you look at that, so that could change, right? So maybe when they start getting toward March, April, they don't need as much fat, but they need the protein for muscle mass because they're courting and flying and getting ready to have to fly back and forth to feed baby birds. Um, I'm saying that as a theory, um, but that's just what, you know, what I'm thinking. You absolutely need to stay away from these. If this is on the bag, go get something else, just get black oil sunflower seeds because yes, it's cheaper because they, they don't eat this. And if they do, it's not going to give them what they need. No fats, no proteins that they need. This is waste. And this is put in food bags to bulk them up. Um, I am like the worst person to run into at Farm and Fleet when I'm buying my bird seed. Because if I see somebody buying stuff that's a waste of money, I go into my whole spiel like, that's lovely. However, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it gets a little creepy, I'm sure. But those are the things you want to look out for in your, in your mixes. Now, they'll not always reap what they sow because they throw it on the ground, but they will reap later. So my, I stop feeding the birds in the spring when I start to see sunflower plants popping up. I figure, you know what? 
if I'm starting to get sunflowers, they don't need it so much. And I need to be done with whatever amount I have. I feed it out and I'm done. But I do like to let the, that's an oil sunflower, oil seed sunflower. Um, I do love to let them grow. And then sometimes they pick them before they have half a chance to get beyond where they're at. And it's fun to watch the, the gold finches on the gold colored sunflowers. And I do leave the, I do, um, you can actually see the sunflowers in this upper right picture, the cotyledons right there. They're all over the place. I'm like, yeah, you're done. No more. That was May 11th. Yeah, you're done. You don't need any more. Go do what you do. Right. Um, so, but I did check and the oil sunflower hulls. Um, I have very few weeds in that garden because it's in a garden that has some um, native mature plants in it. And then a couple hostas near the shady part of the house and they all grow just fine. And then it's almost no, and it's pretty, it's really consistent mulch. Food storage is important, right? I'm, I'm sure you guys know that. Plastic, um, the problem is plastic. We, we had a plastic bin in a foyer and the squirrels came in the foyer and just chewed through the plastic and then the mice can get in. So kind of consider where it's stored um, and what you can use. Um, and think about you carrying food. So what are you gonna scoop it with? How close can it be to where you wanna be? Um, can you balance what you're carrying? and then go out. When we have really snowy nights, I'll bring the feeders in and put them on a towel in the breezeway and let them melt down. And then I'll fill them. Well, of course I fill them in the house and then I bump the door and seeds go everywhere. So it's a calamity, but it's so nice in the morning to fill them in the warmth and then just carry them out and hang them up. I'm, I'm known for throwing my parka over my bathrobe just to get the food out there in the morning. It's yeah, the neighbors don't see. So water. If you can, water attracts more individuals and more species and you will get more migratory birds if you have water out. You can get uh, bird bath heaters and you can clip them on. I had one clipped at one time to a black roaster pan. I mean, anything works. You know, you don't want to fill it too deep because if they go in, you don't want them to be too deep. But um, if the water's there, they don't have to burn the calories that they just ate just to go over and find a creek or, and if it's frozen solid, like, our, you know, ours was till today, um, they have to find moisture. They have to eat snow that's cold, that burns calories. So, you know, consider that, um, that water being really important and make sure it's easily accessible, easy to clean. Don't go too crazy. I think there's a picture of mine in here. And I, this is true. If you did, if you can't afford, don't want to spend the money, but you want to see birds, water will attract birds. Get a bird bath that's, um, I don't, I, I don't know if any of you had one. I had a heated bird bath. It evaporated constantly. Um, so I just got the clip on bird bath heater, ran a outdoor extension line to an outlet, um, kept it pretty close. So that wasn't too long. And I get more birds because of water than I do for food. So that's always an option because you always have access probably to put water in there. Um, and then preferably clean it, you know, um, I'd clean it just once a week on the weekend, scrub it well, put it in the bathtub or something somewhere where you can scrub it down or a utility sink, put it back out, put fresh water in it. Um, it's, it's, it'll get more birds. These migratory birds like this summer tanager came through the nature center. It didn't eat anything in the feeder, but it, it was in a pool of, um, the kids had made little on the ground pools of water that I, you could just throw water in and flush them out and throw clean water in. And that's why she was there. She wanted the water. We've had all kinds of warblers I can't even name because again, I did, I did ducks and geese. <laughs> there's, there's my water. That's my, that's my whole water system right there. And then I clamp, I run the cord underneath. I clip it underneath with the, um, to the extension cord. So it's under where water doesn't drip on it. And I just wind it up and run the cord to the house. And it's not, it's not so big. You can't just flip and dump it, carry out a pitcher and add water. And if you feed them, they will come. I know it's tricky. I just, you know, at the nature center, I'm not going to fight the world of a forest preserve. I just let them go. It's fun. We can see what's going on. If I see mange on a mammal, which is usually not the raccoons, it's usually the squirrels, then I stop feeding altogether to quit drawing them together so that nobody else gets mange. I love this picture at the bottom. It's one of my 13 line ground squirrels at my house. And it moved like the Grinch, you guys. It literally, I only saw it because it was S curving through the ground, picking up the random seeds. Um, it was spring. Um, I'm sure there was baby, a baby situation going on and she was hungry. I just thought it was fascinating that she could, I didn't see her till she moved. Um, I keep saying she, cause she was quite plump. 
And some of you are probably going, oh my gosh, not ground squirrels. I'm, I'm a naturalist, not a gardener. I'm not good at it. So um, I don't care really who eats as long as they stay outside. Um, yeah, my, most of the feeders have no squirrel protection. I feed, I don't, I don't fight it. Um, Bill, I just, I don't, I, I, it's not that I don't care. It's an energy I don't want it to give. Um, I actually had a gentleman come to the bird feeding window at the nature center years ago. And he said, what do you do to keep the squirrels out of your feeders? And I know this story. I know many people don't want to feed the squirrels. And I looked at him. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to do that. And he looked at me like, yeah. And he goes, oh, and he smiled. He goes, funny. I'm like, I just can't pick that war. Um, I don't mind them. I, it, it's just not, you know, they eat less than the deer. <laughs> so, so I just kind of don't battle that. Um, and I'm, I was, a, I studied fur bearing mammals. So there's probably a bit of a, a bias there for me too. So I checked these links, they're still good um, because like I said, I made this uh, a few years ago and at the Project Feeder Watch, and if you just, if you don't wanna write all that down, if you just put in Project Feeder Watch, Cornell, Project Feeder Watch, they've got some really cool stuff all the time, really flashy, um, exciting. You can put in your own data. So in the winter, when you want a project, um, they will have Nest Watch also in the spring. So if you wanna, um, you know, spend some time doing those projects. That's fun. And it's a good citizen science activity, uh, keeps people involved and they can use the, and they can use um, that data that you send in. The Bird Conservancy, I got on there to check it tonight when I got home from work before I got on with you guys. And they had a Valentine Day um, bird quiz <laughs> and all these little things that birds do when they're courting. So I had to stop and take the quiz. So that was fun. And then of course the Audubon Society. Um, I will be um, doing a program March 1st on woodpeckers for the Northwest Audubon. Um, if you go up, um, you can probably find it online somewhere. It's open to the public uh, or go to our, um, maybe our extension website for um, University of Illinois Extension. If you pick the Boone to Cowboy Ogle section, that's what I cover. Um, there should be, it should be up on the website. That'll be the woodpecker program I talked about. And those are fun. It's fun to be involved. Um, and to see what's going on and to, and to see changes and to keep some phenology for yourself, a journal in the winter on who you're seeing and how many and why. I keep, all these people keep telling me how they're seeing so many more blue jays because like any other animal, there's an ebb and flow to the number of blue jays. And it's funny that every, I'm hearing it from a lot of different areas. So their numbers are up. And I think that's interesting. And finally, um, I put this in here. This is cat TV. This is my cat looking out over the backyard. Um, when I used to have enough light for a garden, it's grown so much. There is a goldfinch on the sunflower and there was another bird um, hidden behind there and a hummingbird. And so I put that on there because, you know, they just sit there thinking it's got to be possible for me to get that, you know, got to get that bird, but it's not easy. It's just what it is. So Thank you. I'm not even watching the time. I apologize. I'm just chatting right through. Um, but I appreciate you spending time listening. I, I'm sure some of you know more than I do about bird feeding. I clearly keep it simple because then I can enjoy it that much more. Um, and I'm quite a budget hound. I buy the bird seed for the nature center myself right now. So I'm buying bird seed for two spaces. Um, and uh, so I, I keep it pretty simple, but uh, Sam, we can open it up to anybody and we have a small group. People can ask or you can check the, the, the Q&A, however you want to do that. Yeah, perfect. Um, I just thank you so much. This was awesome. And I love all the photos. Um, I just want to let everybody know I put some links in there for the upcoming Clem programs to take you to our event calendar, mm -hmm. as well as the link for Winter Trails and Naturalist Tales mm -hmm. um, so that you could find those a little bit easier. But nice. yes, do we have any questions that anybody wants to ask? And if you're interested, um, the session I'm doing up at, up <laughs> at um, the Naturalist Trails thing or whatever, Naturalist Tales, I'm doing a nest box for all animals. So different kinds of how to build nest boxes to increase your habitat in, in your area, you know, around your, your area, your home or wherever. Um, I've only offered it to Southern Illinois conservation group. So I haven't offered it up here yet. So if you're interested, that's what that's going to be. The one I'm doing there with the other people that are speaking. Cool. Some yeah, projects. Yeah. 
Um, all right, some questions coming in. Are bluebirds winter birds? Oh, excuse me. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, pictures on the internet of bluebird males all packed into bluebird houses for the winter. I don't see them. They, I usually unplug our bird, we have a bluebird trail on the way into our, our forest preserve. And I usually unplug those um, when I see the first male actually looking for a, for a house and for looking for shelter. And that's usually in April. Um, but other people have said they've spotted them earlier than that. And some people feel that in mild years that they're still around. I've not seen that myself. So but evidently they do, but they should be, I'm actually doing a bluebird one too coming up a few times. I don't know, look for it. I, I'm all over the place. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good thing to say. Um, but yeah, the Eastern bluebirds are phenomenal and they're adorable, right? So, yeah. Um, another question, what is the fat content of safflower seed? I don't know. I don't know that answer. I do know I've tried using it and it sat and never got touched. So in the middle of winter, I'm gonna guess the fat content is lower than the three I showed you, which were the highest three, because I was kind of encouraging, you know, that fat content feeding. Um, but I'm sure you could find that on the internet. But it was it would be lower than those those first three that I gave you. Um, some people say they tend to start hitting it more in the spring, so maybe it's higher in protein. Yeah, could be. I've never had any luck with it, so I quit spending money trying. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm going to go out of order here a little bit. Um, there is one comment here that says that they have seen bluebirds uh, this winter, never at our nice. feeders, but just getting water. So there you go. There's that yeah. magic water thing. Good. And, and if you don't mind, could you tell us just the area you live in, like the person with the bluebirds? It'd be interesting to know if there's habitat that's more specific. And if not, that's fine, whatever. You, I'm just interested because I want to see them too. <laughs> yeah. Um, while we wait for that to hopefully come in, another quick comment here um, is that um, Betsy, hi Betsy, has cardinals that love safflowers. So she goes through a lot of that um, and that's near uh, Midway Village Museum in, okay. in Rockford. So I guess she has luck with safflower for the cardinals. Nice. Excellent to hear because I just I I've tried bags twice in my feeding world and it's just sat and sat and sat and sat. Yeah. I even tried to trick them and mix it. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Funny how that works. Um, and the bluebird bluebird person, thank you for contributing. Um, lives about two miles outside of Byron. Um, they have woods near the yard um, and think okay. they live in the woods during the winter. Yep, because I know ours come to the woods first before they go out in the open uh, okay. to guard their box. So that makes sense. And that is awesome. Thank you for sharing, because I think that's really interesting to know where those things are happening. And those are the things that if you get on like the Cornell citizen science stuff, that's stuff they're going to want to know. And you could participate just by letting them, you know, know um, that you have that. Yeah, very, very cool. Okay, so back to a couple of questions here. Um, We've got a question here. I love to feed birds in the winter, but we go, but we like to go away for about a month. Should I just forget about winter feeding? No, you know, we've taught, I've seen a lot of that where they're like, we have to have somebody feed on this. They're, they, they know how to feed and they know how to survive. It's easy street when you're there, but think about how beefed up they are before you go. And they know where they, they have food. It's just not as easy to get. So they don't want to work for it. We make them lazy. Um, but no, by all means. And when you come back, if you start feeding them for some reason, or you need to finish off the food, they'll be, they'll see your car drive in the driveway, you know, they know, but, um, they've done some studies and it, we always used to say, don't leave, you know, have somebody feed them. And it's, and it, if we think about birds, not even needing us truly, we could actually be affecting the bird populations with an overpopulation problem because the birds who wouldn't make it through winter who don't have that easy access food and they're not capable physically or something to get food, we may be keeping more birds alive than normally would be. So I, I have no problem with you enjoying that and driving away and then picking it up again if you want to finish off whatever food you have. Um, uh, 
I think, and you, you leave them in a good position. They're all stocked up on fat, you know, so they have time to find other feeders and other, other places to eat in the woods or wherever you live. Sure. So kind of, that kind of goes hand in hand here. Um, somebody's asking, you don't have feeders out in the summer? I don't because I don't have that. I don't want to spend the money. They need to learn how to eat their own food, you know, True. and they need to be taught. And so another thing you got to remember that a lot of our seed eating birds, they don't feed seeds to their babies. They're eating the seeds for themselves. They're feeding insects. The best thing you could do for feeding birds is to plant native plants in your yard that attract the native insects then more animals, more birds will physically be in your yard in the spring and nest nearby because you've brought in their, their food they have to feed their young. So chickadees feed like, I think it's like a thousand something insects a day to a nest of babies all day oh long, goodness. both parents all day long, all day long, all day long. So they're not going to be in your yard if you feed seed only to come over to your yard, grab a seed for themselves. But really they're all eating insects. Those are what they want and need. Um, and the babies cannot live on bird seed they have to have fleshy little protein you know with legs so plant those plant those plants those nates you know mix natives into your gardens and draw those insects and then you'll have a plethora of birds nesting um, around and within reason obviously they fight for territory but that's the best way to draw them and to help them yeah but if you want to uh, feed them go for it <laughs> it doesn't matter <laughs> Um, so another question, where do you find the cheapest sunflower seeds? You know, all the main big stores, you know, I can't, I, you know, say go to this, I, I price things. So I'll go to Walmart, I'll go to Menards, I'll go to Farm and Fleet. I go to all those type of stores. If I'm doing other errands and keep my eye on the, on the ball, um, I buy it by the 50 pound bag, but when you do the math, um, recently Walmart's 40 pound bag was cheaper per pound. So I get it there then. Um, and so I just, I kind of shift around a little bit, especially for the nature center. We're, we're closed right now. So there, I can justify buying bird, the, the black whale sunflower seed on our budget when it's to teach kids about birds, which we do a lot of, but I can't justify using our budget money to buy bird seed for the birds. Um, I do it at home. So I've been buying both. And that's why I waited till February when things are really kind of sparse right now and it's still really cold. So now I feel like I'm, I'm going to help, help out. And plus I'm dying to see living things, you know? <laughs> so it took probably a week and a half, two weeks for the birds to find my feeders because really? they're out there getting their own food. And you can see, I live by a field. So they're probably all the way back in the very back where there's a Creek um, and trees, but they finally found it. So nice. Um, another question here. I only have one bird feeder outside. If I put several out next year, will it attract more birds or will the same ones eat from, from them? Um, in times of high snows and stuff, you'll get more because you'll have more space. They fight, they fight over places, they fight and niches. So you're only going to get, if you put out more feeders, but they're all the same kind, they're all tube feeders. You're going to get the birds that prefer. You're not going to get the juncos. Um, you're going to get the finches and the sparrows and um, but if you put out like a tray feed, if you mix and match your feeders, yes, you'll get a bigger variety. Cool. Um, and then two questions I'm kind of, kind of combine into one here asking about, um, what plants, um, can be planted? What native plants do you plant, um, to attract them? Oh, I do a lot. So I don't want my yard to look like a prairie, but I want it to look like a flower garden. So a lot of what I plant, um, uh, are the echinacea, you know, a lot of the, the, um, I do get on the ragweed and not ragweed <laughs> on the goldenrod. People always go, is that ragweed? No, it's goldenrod. I get a lot of bigger insects on the goldenrod. Um, so if I get a, if I get too many other insects, they're my, they're my control for the excess insects because they're the <laughs> insect eaters of the insect world. So the picture that you see there, there's, that was before my native times. And there's, there's a bunch of strange things out there. Um, but I do, I have so many different plants. I have poppies. I have um, prairie pea, which are so easy. They self-plant every year. Um, I have um, prairie drop seed. I like short grasses. I don't like the crazy tall grassy prairie look. I like plant, you know, flowers. 
I have um, Jacob's Ladder. I have um, Black Eyed Susan's trying to look at, I'm, I'm looking down thinking, you know, what do I have in my garden? And I've been slowly expanding and taking out my non-natives, but I, you know, I have hostas. They're my placeholders, right? They keep everything dead underneath. Nothing likes to grow in that dense shade. My toads love them. So I'm slowly going through my yard and just doing some replacement and letting the non-native plants hold. But I'll tell you, I have more nests around my yard of different species of birds now than I ever had. I've had um, I had two green tree frogs two years ago, one in the front, one in the back. Um, that field behind me went organic. So now I'm even getting more. Uh, so anything uh, that is going to draw, and actually, I don't know, there may be people on here that love to mow. Um, God bless you. I just hate mowing. But I'd, I let the clover, the white clover that's always been in our yard since we were kids, I let it grow in patches if I see it. And the cardinals, live in that with their babies they literally sit in it and they jump and kick the bugs and turn and feed them they just so when i get a patch of clover going i just let it grow um and they just they work it more than the violets which are native um so you just kind of kind of watch but look for things that are going to draw you're looking for any kind of um plant that might draw small insects you know that the birds can grab and and pick at and put you know that are going to have the small, I know there's small moths in there. There's the little blue butterflies in there and they're all getting eaten, but I have plenty, you know, plenty now. But that's hard for people who love to mow and love to have a, a lawn. So I know that's hard. So, um, but that's where I see most of my cardinal activity is in the clover. That's interesting. I've never, never heard that before. It's because you, you probably mow better than I do. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> that's okay. Um, Betsy said she puts out mealworm for the chickadees in winter. Um, are they alive or dead, Betsy? Are they, are they the dry ones or live ones? Let's see. My live ones crawl away. Do they? <laughs> I always think the live ones would be better, but. she's still on here the bluebirds and the bluebirds like them too the dry the mealworms yeah the bluebirds especially when they're you know breeding and courting and breeding um, sure and if you start to see the cardinals my dad he was um he was a world war ii vet and uh grew up in the depression and he said you know that it's spring when the cardinals are eating at the same level you know so they understood niches they didn't have all that science behind it and i said what do you mean he goes he goes, because when they eat at the same level, that's when they're a breeding pair. And I thought, I wonder what that is. Well, later I found out that when a male wants to uh, court a female, he has to hand her a seed and she has to accept the seed. So they have to basically almost kiss. And I thought, well, now it makes sense because you can't like spit it at her from up on a platform feeder. That'd be rude. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of cool to see the phenology from the 20s, 30s, 40s turn into the science that we now watch and see um so that's kind of cool that is cool um it looks like betsy's not on anymore so i guess we will yeah the mealworms if i've put out live ones in the spring um but i don't i just don't have the bluebird population without you know the tree i have a yard but i have a field so i have a lot of trees in my yard but i need need more habitat i think to draw them more mature sure. trees too yeah all right, I'm gonna do one more scan here for questions. Well, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. I appreciate your time. Let's go through this one. I forgot about this picture. It's like, wow, I just, I had a garden and, but now all my <laughs> trees are so big, it's so shady. I can't grow, except in the far left back corner, I can't grow anything like vegetables, you know? The sure, sure. Light. It's not enough light. Oh, another comment I missed was that um, somebody's uh, squirrels love to eat the safflower seed. Aha. That's what would happen. That's what would happen. Don't they love everything? Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I think we've got just about all of the oh, nice. questions answered. Um, and let me type in your email address in the chat box. Yeah, feel um, free. In case... Yeah. 
anybody else has questions, they can always email them to you um, as they think of them and, sure. and share your stories. I love, you know, I love hearing the bird stuff. And then I can always add that into the program too later that somebody saw, you know, the bluebirds, you know, and it just, it adds to the program. If I can share what you want to share with me. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, again, if you um, want to do any other bird type activities for this month, um, check out what we've got going on and what um, Extension has got going on. There's plenty to do in, um, in the state line area. And thank you again to you, Peggy, for doing this program. It was a lot of fun and always uh, so much fun to learn from you. We will, oh, you. Um, we're recording this webinar, so we will post it on our um, website. So if you, you know, missed part of it, or if you want to share it with a friend or anything, it'll be there um, to check out at a later time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Uh -huh.